Hi, I'm Ian Mean, I'm Content Director for the Local World Newspaper Group, of which the Bristol Post is part. The Bristol Post is one of the main sponsors for the University of West of England Distinguished Executive Series. Now, this is a series of debates, and tonight I'm talking to Sir Wynne Bischoff. He's Chairman of Lloyd's Banking Group, and has just been appointed by the government to be Chairman of the Financial Reporting Council. So when um, the government's today launched the second sale of Lloyd's Banking Group shares following its bailout in 2008, uh, can you give us your view to that move? Your Chief Executive, and I'm quoting from the Telegraph here this morning, uh, he says, I believe this reflects the hard work undertaken over the last three years to make Lloyds a safe and profitable bank. And the big thing is focused on helping Britain prosper. I think, um, obviously, I um, agree with those sentiments. Uh, I think there's another thing, and that is that, uh, in my view, it's not healthy for the government to have big states and banks. Uh, obviously, we're very grateful that at the time the taxpayer effectively stepped in uh, to help Lloyds Bank, but from a longer term point of view, it's not the best shareholder. Uh, and to the extent that it can actually come out at a profit from a, from a taxpayer's point of view, I think that's very good. Uh, and that's what we've done. This is the second sale, uh, and it's down below 25%, which I think psychologically is also quite important. Um, the, it's also an indication, of course, that A, there has been hard work, course, but that the bank is in a sound position that the government actually feels it can reduce its, uh, its, its share ownership, and that means that it's in a sound capital position. If it's a sound capital position, it can lend. And so, you know, all these things in a way are interwoven. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's very welcome. Uh, it's, uh, we're very pleased uh, with that, uh, and I think the fact that it corroborates our view that this is now getting to be a normal bank and a very sound bank is quite important. And how long will it be before the, uh, let's say, the encumbrance of the government uh, has gone? Yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, what we always say, it's, it's up to the government because they choose, they're the owner, they decide when to sell, they in, inform us, but, uh, you know, pretty much at the last moment. Um, my own view is that they will look very hard to see whether there is, uh, you know, the next 15 months before the next election will give them uh, a window. I think at the same time there won't be a false seller. They'll sell um, because they think it's a good time to sell rather than having to sell. Uh, we would like it to be sooner rather than later, but quite honestly, they've been a good shareholder. Uh, we have never had any problems. Uh, they've been a very supportive shareholder. They like our business model very much, which is helping Britain prosper in the commercial space in which we have a very strong position, which is a small to medium-sized enterprise and uh, the commercial market as well as the mortgage market, of course. Yeah, just uh, actually, cut, knowing I was going to interview, I cut something out of the Sunday Telegraph a couple of weeks ago. Lloyd's still in an extra billion pounds of SMEs. So yes. We, we're talking here in Bristol and this is uh, very much uh, an SME market. Yes. Uh, what, what sort of uh, confidence can you give to SMEs down here, Sir Wynne, about Lloyds and lending? Are you prepared to lend to them? A, we're prepared to lend. Our chief executive and the management team uh, has as one of its objectives, to which some of the incentive compensation is, uh, is based uh, um, and biased, is uh, lending, increasing lending to SMEs. Uh, this is something which is very important. Uh, large companies can always have access to capital markets, they can have the bond market, but smaller companies, particularly the S's of the SMEs, mm. only have the, the banks to turn to. So we um, are very keen that we should increase our SME lending. Um, and I have a, a, a personal view that we should also concentrate on the M. But of course, because the M's can become then larger companies, but in order to have a, a decent number of M's, you have to have S's. So it really is 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 is, uh, is connected. And I know this part of the world is actually um, very good at at, um, uh, at innovation and uh, having companies come up and uh, entrepreneurialism. Mm. 
Now, you've come out of the, uh, the banking crisis and you look pretty well. You don't look too scarred. Um, but is the banking sector's public image really improving now? Because the public finds it quite hard, don't they, to understand this? Do you know, um, and the, the, the banks have much to blame themselves for. Um, um, some very bad decisions were taken, some very bad behaviour, so there were judgments that were wrong, uh, uh, not uh, in line with what I would call prudent banking. Uh, there was behaviour which was obviously reprehensible, um, and there was the financial crisis itself which enveloped all those who, in fact, did not run themselves as prudently as they should have done. That's one thing. Uh, at the same time, and the last thing is that people paid themselves at times when they were making poor profits or, or losses, paid themselves well. And I think that's something which grates with people. Uh, people talk about trust. I think trust is very difficult to re-establish. My own view on this is that look at the components of trust, which is transparency, good service, fair dealing with your customers, uh, it's uh, good conduct. These are the kind of things which people will say, yes, my bank is delivering some of that. As soon as you ask them about trust, it's become such a, a phrase associated with banks and seeking to re-establish trust. I think what we have to do is take trust, look at the component parts and build those up and then get to a stage where people will actually say, well, it's these, these factors and yes, we trust them again, but it won't come overnight. I think um, I, I think it'll take quite some time. Is it a long journey? I think it's a longish journey. The first thing is, my own view has always been, you trust somebody more who doesn't owe you money. Lloyds and RBS owns, uh, owes money to the taxpayer. We're less likely to be trusted. Now, there are other banks, of course, also, who haven't had any uh, government involvement. Um, but there is still a, a feeling that uh, you know they needed to be supported, and to the extent that, that banks needed to be supported, I think they're less trusted than otherwise they would have been. Yeah. The other thing I would say to you is, the banks are not very good at explaining their business. Um, you know, how we do this, I just don't know. Uh, do we get do, do banks and the education authorities make people a little bit more financially literate, which means that they would understand banks? Mm -hmm. We all know, and the government that banks are a vital part of our type of economy. If that weren't the case, they wouldn't have had to save them. Um, you know, they couldn't have let them go. And uh, so, but does, does the public at large understand that? And have we been sufficiently informative of why it is that we are an important part of the intermediation process and so on? So I think this is something that will need to be done. I mean, isn't a lot of this quite basic stuff? When I was being brought up, I was quite fearful of the bank. Yes. Um, as you might be a, a policeman. Yes. But, you know, isn't this not about the banks, the retail banks, that most people in this area would yes. go into? Yes. It's not those people, yes. is it? No. Uh, no, the, the, the polls that we've taken, uh, both at Lloyd's and the industry has taken, are very clear, and that is the approval rating uh, for the branch that you deal with, for the people in the branch, mm. perhaps even the regional office uh, of a business, is high. Uh, it's effectively people say it's these clowns sitting back at head office, uh, you know, who've, who've messed it up or who've not been careful enough about what some of their people are doing. Is that so, true? And, and uh, of course, ultimately it's true because the big decisions, which either go wrong or right, are taken in the head office. So uh, I, I think it is right to some extent, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so you're now stepping into an, another hot seat, or probably a hotter seat, as uh, chairman of the um, Financial Reporting Council. Mm -hmm. So the government is asking you, Sir Wynn, to sort of take charge of this. Yes. So how are you going to do that? Because <laughs> you've been running a bank, Yes. You've now got to actually say, you've got to get your house in order. How are you going to do that? Yes. The house in order, of course, is in terms of governance. Uh, that's one thing, and I think, that's, I think it's very important. And secondly, of course, uh, the, uh, the Financial Reporting Council is the independent supervisor of accounting and actuarial mm. standards uh, and, uh, uh, and disciplines. Um, it is private sector funded, but it has, of course, got powers which are given to it by government. 
it comes under the uh, BIS. Um, so it's a it's an amalgam of private and 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 government. It is a body which uh, seeks to raise standards, uh, and its main objective for doing so is to make the capital markets, the investment markets, more understandable. It has a remit that um, the annual report and accounts and the communications with shareholders should be open, should be balanced, should be understandable. There's so much guff now that's written which is totally not understandable by, by people. So it's that kind of thing and that makes the United Kingdom in terms of financial transaction more investable i.e. that people will understand. There's, this, there's a little bit of a thread of financial literacy running through that too, which I mentioned before. Yeah. I mean, going back on the education uh, of, of people, is it, is it simplistic to say that perhaps that should start in schools? I, I'd, uh, I, didn't, uh, I, I didn't command school budgets and, and schools, uh, uh, the syllabus, but I think that's right because you know, we are not as financially literate as we should be. For example, the whole question about pensions, which has come up, of course, in the budget. Um, it is said that 50% of the population does not, cannot, in fact, work out percentages. Well, if you can't yeah. work out percentages, yeah. it's very difficult to say what percentage of a pot that you may have put aside for your pension will last until you're 85 rather than 78 or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, it's these kind of things which are going to be uh, Im important. They're not, they're not all that difficult. I mean, they don't all have to be um, um, super numerate, but you have to have some element nowadays, particularly as you live longer and the state will not be able to pri provide everything for you. You have to have an element of financial literacy, I believe. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the average age now, if you're um, um, a, a young boy born in London and you survive the first year, the average that you're going to be at, women, uh, girls are, are even longer lived, 89 years. Yeah. You know, now, very, it's very unlikely that we all work till 89 years. We might... <laughs> you might. Uh, uh, well, even I shall. <laughs> but it might, get, you know, people might work to 70, but it still leaves, for the average, another 20 years where they have to actually deal with money and, and make judgments as to what they're going to spend and what they're going to save, etc., etc. So I think it is becoming, it's becoming more of a social need, I believe, than it ever has been. But isn't there a role here for the banks? Yes, I, I because, totally agree. Because, I mean, I totally say, agree. putting someone in the position you yeah. talked about, yeah. they don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. Could they go to the bank? I mean, it's difficult to ring up a bank now. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's difficult to know who your manager is. Yes. But to come in, so I'm, I'm really worried, yes. uh, Win, yes. uh, about the position yes. of my pension. Yes. That's right. I just have a feel, is that right, that they could, should be able to do that? They should be able to do that. Under the Financial Conduct Authority, of course, it's much prescribed because of some of the mis-selling that is going on. Yeah. You know, we, we are, we, it's very difficult for us to give advice um, um, to, 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 to certain people who aren't necessarily but you financially... you trusted a bank, didn't you? Yeah. You would say... Yeah. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I've got a problem. Yeah. yeah. And where this may happen, um, um, you know, advice is, 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 is quite difficult because, uh, uh, but it should certainly be possible that with the approval of the Financial Conduct Authority, you give, for example, to somebody a laminated sheet of paper, double sided, which shows a decision tree which they have to take. And then yeah. perhaps come at the end, yeah. having made their decision, they go to the bank and say, This is what I want you to do. There is a, there's a fear that uh, the regulators have, uh, given uh, the history in the past, that there may in fact be mis-selling. And the banks themselves are very worried about it because the mis-selling, for example, that took place on PPI, yeah. of which we were the greatest culprit, yeah. culprit, has cost so many billions that we are actually becoming reluctant on giving advice you know, because it may come to haunt isn't, isn't that a bit of a cop-out? Of course it if, is. If you it's by both. It's the regulator and the banks. I believe we should get back to an, an area where, in fact, there is a safe harbour for the banks to give advice. Mm. Uh, it, it, but it will have to be, it it will have to be, really delineated uh, in accordance with the uh, requirements of the Financial Conduct Authority. And then, uh, but to 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 allow people, in very simple terms, to go through a decision tree: yes, no, yes, no, and 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 to work it out. 
an element of it themselves and then come ultimately to to, to conclusion what they want to do and then either transact with a bank or an, interna- uh, an, an independent financial advisor or with their building society or whatever it is. In your new role, could you have influence on that? We'll see. Uh, we'll see. And you seem so trepidatious about that. Well, I'm not, um, uh, you know, I haven't yet taken on the role and um, we have a very... Uh, good uh, council, obviously, and very uh, highly uh, qualified people. Um, we will have to see, we, you don't want to over-regulate, I mean, there's a multiplicity, there's already a financial conduct authority. We, we obviously work very closely at the Financial Reporting Council with them and with the PRA, uh, which looks at the balance sheet and the funding of mm-hmm. banks, uh, but um, one has to be very careful that but if you have too many people, it, something falls between the, uh, the cracks. But I think it's an interesting thought. Yeah. Now, over-regulation, um, that can lead to stifling innovation. Can it can. So how do you get over that? Because we're constantly hearing, oh, well, if we do that, all the best people are going to leave and go to the Far East or America. So how do you get over uh, making sure people do the right things without overburdening them with uh, regulation? Well, first of all, I think most people uh, have actually a pretty well-developed moral sense. Uh, I think uh, regulation, in most cases, doesn't go beyond that. I think it's just reminding people of what the right thing to do is. Mm. I don't think people mind that so much. And quite honestly, if they do mind, then they're probably not the right people for the organization that you want to uh, represent. I think in terms of um, doing the right thing, it's very important also to link the culture of the firm to the strategy of the firm. Uh, obviously, if you, you have to have a somewhat different culture when you're dealing with retail customers, largely as we do, or as some of the building societies do, as against le- de- dealing largely with wholesale customers, which the investment banks have to do. You still have to do the right thing, but the, uh, the burden on you um, as a banker in an investment bank to explain everything is less burdensome when you're dealing with wholesale customers who are financially, a BP is pretty financially illiterate or a Unilever or, um, or, or a large GKN or whatever yes. it is. But you do have a much greater burden of explaining things and being fair and, and, and proportionate with, uh, with retail customers. I don't believe that Regulation in itself uh, is an inhibitor to um, innovation. Um, I think it's multiplicity um, and falling between cracks and not being certain of what the regulation is that inhibits that. Yeah. Regulation, we've always had regulation. People have always had regulation. Cool. They've had regulation in the Roman Empire, how to, you know, how to cook bread and so on. That's okay, bread is still cooked. Yeah. What about geopolitics? I mean, people talk about that. And, uh, you know, we particularly look at the uh, EU of what's happening there. Mm-hmm. Uh, being in some counts, you know, the growth of China and perhaps the uh, exit uh, away from the US. How do you see geopolitics affecting our economy? Ours is a very international economy. It's one of the most internationally uh, biased economies uh, in, in the world. It's also a very heavy service oriented financial and professional services oriented economy, and those economies uh, and those services are provided on a global basis. Um, we have a very high proportion, far, far higher than other countries in professional services, which is law, accountancy, consulting, auditing, etc., quite apart from banking, insurance, asset management, and, and, and so on. And um, we know that London is a large market domestically. Whatever happens to you politically, the financial services sector will survive. But some of the fastest growth, of course, is international growth, yeah. which happens to come into London because the services are very good there. Um, clever people, uh, English law, uh, um, the time, uh, the language, uh, uh, the, from a time point of view, extremely well located. And that's what I fear, that, for example, exiting certain markets, um, will in fact impair that growth uh, and will impair the large share of GDP which is about 14% their professional services and uh, do you, when services. you say exiting certain markets would you look at the EU as, as one of those markets yes I do um, I take the view um, 
that just as um, America